Hi, this is Natalie Hoffman of FlyingFreeNow.com, and you're listening to the Flying Free Podcast, a support resource for women of faith looking for hope and healing from hidden emotional and spiritual abuse. Welcome to episode 135 of the Flying Free Podcast. Our guest today is Bruce Fleming. He's the founder of the True 316 Project and the speaker on the Eden Podcast. Bruce is a former academic dean and professor of practical theology in French-speaking Africa. He's also the author of the Book of Eden, Genesis 2 and 3. Welcome to the podcast, Bruce. Thank you very much, Natalie. I'm very happy to be with you. So this is kind of a last minute thing. I found Bruce, I've actually heard your name and I've seen, I think I've seen it on social media. I'm in a Facebook group that I think we were both in, um, biblical Christian egalitarians or something like that. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I'm not on Facebook that much, but I happen to see, and I've seen your podcast, but I've, it's never registered. You know how you have to sometimes see things several times before you finally go, what is that? (laughs) Well, I did that this week. I was like, what is this? Actually, you know what it was? I saw someone comment on it and say, I think it was in that group actually, And their comment came up in my feed and it said, I've been binge listening to the Eden podcast and I just love it. And I I was like, for some reason, I thought, what is that? And I clicked over and then I started binge listening to it. (laughs) And I was like, oh my gosh, everyone needs to listen to this podcast. It's so amazing. The thing I love about your podcast is that it takes you you break everything down into these short little episodes. They're like 15 or 20 minutes long at the most. That's right. And you explain things really, really clearly. Like I need to be, ex- I need you to explain things to me like I'm a kindergartner when it comes to theology. And I, I, I just don't think that way. I'm a, I've been immersed in the Bible since I was a kid, but I just read the Bible. You know, I read the Bible and I've done Bible studies, but I've, I'm not familiar with the Greek and the Hebrew, and I've never done anything like that. You break it down then for those of us who are kind of not into all of that in such a way that we can understand really clearly what is going on in these verses. And you've been blowing my mind. Well, I'm happy to hear that. You're not the first one, but I'm happy to hear that true for you too. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and here's the other thing I really like about your podcast and your voice is that I come out of a very conservative Christian upbringing and then was immersed in that my whole whole adult life. And your voice and the way you talk reminds me of that, um, that kind of that world where the pastors or the leaders were very, um, they just sounded like they knew what they were talking about. (laughs) And when you come out of that, you, my brain, my programming says that's how someone needs to sound if they're telling the truth. Now, they, now some of those people weren't always telling the truth, but that's what my program is. So, when you, so if you're spe- the people that need to hear your message mm-hmm. are people coming out of that. They're the people that have been marinating in all of these really patriarchal. I want to call them straight up lies. I don't think people know that they're lying. I think they've just been believing this their whole lives. They don't understand that it's not true, but they've been marinating in that their whole lives. And they need to, they need to make some kind of a connection with someone who seems like they're coming, like they're coming from that perspective in order to, do you know what I'm saying? Because I've read, I've read books by people that are outside of that perspective and I love the new books I'm reading, but back then when I was immersed in this conservative culture, I thought people like that were heretics. So in other words, what I'm trying to say is I would have thought, I wouldn't have thought you were a heretic because you sound like a Christian, like pastor. Do you see what I'm saying? (laughs) Uh, Well, I happen to be a Christian and and I happen to be a pastor (laughs) and I happen to be a professor of practical theology. So I like keeping things practical. And I've been deeply marked because I used to be a Youth for Christ staff member okay. and, a, and a youth pastor. And I was a junior high English teacher. And that's kind of the level that I, I like to present things at. If it's clear enough for that, then it's, it's clear enough. And I like yes. That. I love it. So God has just 
he's like perfectly positioned you for this okay. message for this yeah. time. And Great. it's so it's so exciting to me. And I'm so glad that you were willing to come on this podcast and that I can introduce your podcast to my listeners. Yeah. So, um, so if you're listening, by the time you're done, you're going to want to head over to his podcast. It's called the Eden podcast and start binge listening. And I recommend starting you have, I think you have four or five seasons. How many seasons do you have now? We're starting into season five, but uh, the first four seasons are the key. And the first season is the foundation for everything. Yes. Yes. And that's what I was going to say. Start with season one. Right. In the very first episode, and I like even how you've laid it out so that it's easy to find Good. everything in the right order. Otherwise, I would have looked at all those Bible verses and I would have been, what well, that's the other thing that I'm not very okay. good at is numbers. Yeah. If I see numbers, they all look the same to me. If you so, go to theedenpodcast.com, then there's even a player right there. You can start listening to episode number one, season one. And I, f- I calculated that when people started listening to our podcast, that they would go to season one, episode one. And that's the one that's gotten more downloads than any. And uh, yeah. so I tried, I tried to front load it. I tried to put all the good stuff right there. Yeah. Well, and I'll, I'm will i going to put in the show notes, I'm going to put my two favorites so far. It wasn't one. I, I can't remember which numbers there were, but there were two that I, I loved so much that blew my particular mind that I, I sent them to my daughter and I'm like, you've got to listen to these two episodes. Okay. So well, six and seven are, are the, there. That's the secret chapter. Episode six talks about the context, the way chapter three is structured and you have to understand that. And then chapter or episode seven goes right into Genesis 316. Okay. That's my second favorite 316 in the Bible. John 316 is my favorite. Yeah. But uh, Genesis 316 is my second favorite. And that's where God speaks to the woman in the Garden of Eden in 11 words. And my wife spent seven years re- researching her doctoral dissertation on those 11 words. And when she did, she was telling me she, she'd come home in the evening and we'd talk about it. And I'd say, you know, that. What you're finding is that influences my thinking about these New Testament passages, and she said, "Well, that's that's good, uh, but I got to keep focusing on on the Genesis." <laughs> and I said, "Yeah, but these New Testament passages." She says, "Well, you do that. Go ahead, and you do that." As it turned out, I ended up doing that because the Lord worked it out that my dissertation topic was stolen in Africa, and uh, I had to fall back on other things that I had done, and I ended up working on the five New Testament passages related to Genesis 3.16. And the big deal about 3.16 that Joy told me was, God didn't curse Eve or Adam or limit man, or no, try it again. God didn't curse Eve or Adam or limit woman in any way. And yet, when we were living, in, and she was researching this while we were in the jungles in Africa, and we were surrounded by great villages and people that spoke lots of different tribal languages, we found out that they all thought that God cursed three times or four times or a lot more times, and God certainly cursed the woman, they thought. Yeah. And, and she was said, no, look, look in the Hebrew words, God didn't curse Eve at all. And I said, well, uh, you can keep going. I want to learn more about this. Let's, let's find out what's going on. Okay. I was going to actually ask you about your marriage with your wife. How long have you guys been married? Oh, ever since the day we got married. So it's been, uh, <laughs> that's, uh, it's pushing four decades. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So I'm curious to know, it's kind of a personal question, but how has your theology or what you've learned over the years, has it had an impact on your marriage? And how would you describe that impact if, if it has? My grandmother, my grandma Edna was the teacher of the largest adult Sunday school class in the church where I grew up. And uh, after she passed away, uh, an uh, and a kind of an obnoxious politician in town. He turned out to be the Sunday school teacher and the class dwindled all the way down to two people. <laughs> and so they, they, he was convinced to give up the reins and went to my mom. And my mom built it right back up again. So I, I'm familiar with women in ministry and, and uh, you know, just, I, I was not in those classes, but I saw what was going on and I, yeah. I love my grandma and I love my mom. And so uh, women in ministry is, is a wonderful thing uh, in my heritage. That was great. When Joy came to uh, seminary, she in college, went to a Christian college and 
usually the second semester, she said, you know, I want to take a Hebrew course. And it turned out they said, no, you got to start in the beginning in the fall because it's a continuous thing. You can't start Hebrew in September or January. So she never did take a, a Bible language in college. So the summer after she was out of university, she came back to town because she was in a wedding and she found out that there was suicide Hebrew uh, being taught at the seminary that where I was. And uh, so she took a six weeks intensive course. And then once she learned it, then she thought, well, now what do I do with it? So she stayed on for the fall quarter to uh, try to learn the biblical content. And while she was there for classes, that's when we met. Okay. So uh, she was involved, you know, studying in the seminary. I was involved uh, on staff at that point, uh, but also have, doing a second master's degree. And uh, that's never really been a problem for us. I found out later that as she was walking across campus, some obnoxious guys would actually stop her and say, what are you doing here? You don't belong here. You know, we, what do you, oh. what's a woman doing here? Uh, but she's, she's very confident and, uh, she was polite but firm and kept going on the sidewalk. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah. So, would you? So, your marriage then has you describe your marriage as a partnership? Then, I would say theologically, we're correct. What I grew up in at home myself was not not egalitarian marriage, and it was a typical hierarchical thing that my you know dad kind of did what he wanted to do, and my mom had a hard time with some of the things he wanted to do. And it was a tough childhood going up. She had a, she had a, uh, almost a miscarriage with my younger sister. And as a result of that, I don't know, chemically or whatever, very hard childbirth, uh, she became an active alcoholic. So mm -hmm. for many years in my childhood, I've got my dad who was kind of an angry domineering person and my mom who was a, uh, an active alcoholic. And uh, so I did not have a good model for me. And I brought that into our marriage. So that wasn't good. Yeah, Joy, she had a wonderful set of parents. Uh, her mom was involved in Bible study fellowship. Her dad was a restaurant owner and had the, the Viking Village smorgasbords here in town, and uh, oh, he yeah. was active in church. And, and yeah, yeah, they were they were wonderful, wonderful parent, uh, in laws for me. Tremendous, uh, oh, great good. model too. Yeah, good. Are your parents still alive? No, we've lost all four now. Yeah. Okay. All right. So for those of you who are listening, Bruce and I live in the same neck of the woods in Minnesota. We are from the Twin Cities. Right. So which is, you know, when you meet people online, you don't expect them to be actually be, <laughs> you know, living near you. But what are you doing for ministry now locally? So we, when she met me, I was already accepted as a missionary candidate and I knew where I was going. I was on my way over to French speaking Africa there was a brand new regional seminary for French speaking Africa, and I was going to be a professor over there. And uh, so as we we're dating, she had to work that through. Not only am I going to marry him, but am I also going to become a missionary? Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was praying like mad and <laughs> she, she got that clarified and we got married. And then um, the, the mission director said, you know, Joy, you've, you've, you're halfway through a master of divinity. And Bruce is going to go over to be a professor at this graduate seminary in Africa. Well, you've got one more year to go. But if you do that, it probably won't be good for your marriage to cram all that in. Brand new newlyweds working really hard on the master's degree. Why don't you take that one year and stretch it into two? And, and then you've got that master's degree. And don't leave the degree studies and just go over and, you know, no. You finish your master's degree and the two of you go over as professors. So that's what we did. And, and so to spend my time, I wanted to be a church planting professor. And so the Lord helped us to go plant a church in a, in a suburb of the Fox River Valley uh, west of Chicago. So we planted a church. I started driving school bus and I thought I would meet kids and families and develop a ministry from that. Instead, while you're waiting at the schools for the next load of kids to come out, uh, bus drivers would talk to each other, and I was able to start leading some of them to the Lord. So our, our church was made up of converted school bus drivers, <laughs> <laughs> which I didn't expect. But uh, that, that's oh. how that happened. And we, we organized the church and left it. And the next week, we were gone on, a, on the plane to two years in, in France because we we're going to French-speaking Africa. Mm -hmm. And I had never had French, and I'd had junior high French. And so we, uh, we went to a wonderful school that the French 
Christians had organized so that missionaries would speak better French when they were ministering in France. So we went there and it only lasted a year. And in Africa, they said, okay, come on down. And we said, you know, we know some French, but we don't know enough to be professors, you know, in the grad school in French. So we've got to stay an extra year if we can, please. And they said, okay. And then the African leader said to us, well, if you're going to work on a doctoral dissertation, do it on something we care about. Don't pick an obscure verse that does us no good. Do it on something worthwhile. So Joy ended up doing hers on Genesis 2 and 3. On the Garden of Eden, who is God? Who is man? What is marriage? What is the, what, you know, what is the first sin? What, is, what are the consequences for that? All of that is great foundational material. And then when we got to Africa, she was professor of Old Testament theology at the seminary. Okay. And then I was working on, I thought, missions and evangelism and church planting and contextualization of theology. And our daughter was born just a couple of months after we arrived in Africa. And uh, we had very little water in our house. Uh, there was just a city water tap outside our back door. So I was outside the back door holding the plastic jug that we were trying to collect water from 30 minutes a day when we had water. Joy was in the back of the house nursing our little baby, and thieves broke in through the first through the front of the house, stole uh, the toys, uh, stole the uh, the cutlery, stole uh, the keys, and also stole what they thought was a treasure box, what was actually the metal filing cabinet with all of my doctoral notes, handwritten notes. And then they that night they stole the fifty five gallon drum of kerosene that we had in our storeroom and. It's a long story, but the result of it was that all my doctoral dissertation was was gone. Wow. All my research was lost. And uh, it was like a death in the family, frankly. Mm -hmm. And a year later, two of the doctors that assisted at, at Joy's delivery of our daughter, uh, both Harvard Med School grads, they said, isn't there anything else you've done at the doctoral level? Well, when we were in Strasbourg, France, we were working with graduate intervarsity students in French, and they asked Joy to do two monthly seminars on Genesis 2 and Genesis 3. And then they asked me to do the New Testament seminars. So we spent that whole academic year working with these students. And so that provided the basis of the material that I used and went on and did my doctoral research. Okay. So that's how that that's how we got involved. Joy did the Old Testament, and I did the New Testament. One of the things that bugs me is that if you go to studies on women in the Bible passages, you go to the passages on women, it just seems like you get clarity and then all of a sudden it, you start turning in circles. You you understand, you think what that passage says and then all of a sudden you're turning in circles. And I think we have to take very seriously what happened in in Genesis chapter 3 where God says to the serpent, uh I take what the woman said seriously, that you deceived her. And because you deceived her, I'm going to confirm that she and you are enemies. I'm going to place uh, you know, enmity between the two of you. I'm confirming that you and she are enemies. People don't pay much attention to the fact that she's got an enemy. Or do they pay attention to the fact that he is her enemy? I think that when we've got passages on women, Satan is out there trying to mess them up. He's a liar. He's a distorter of truth. And, and what he's done now is he's, first of all, distorted the key verse, which is Genesis 3.16. And anytime you get these New Testament passages that touch on the Garden of Eden, you, you enter into this warp zone. It's like, you know, you're, 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 you're kind of dizzy. What's, what's going on here? And, and to correct all of that, I founded the True 316 Project. I want to true up the verse. We want to have it. It's tr true and clear. And so when Joy came up with a clear understanding of the 11 Hebrew words, and then we came home and we were asked by the Christians for Biblical Equality movement that it was just starting. Can you take your 407 page dissertation, Dr. Joy Fleming, and condense that into something we can, we can read and we can publish for others? She did. She got it down to about 50 pages and they printed it up and sold it and sold it out. And, and then it was out of print. And in the last couple of years, I realized, you know, this whole new generation of people don't know what she wrote, don't know what she said, and uh, nor the New Testament work that I did afterwards. So that's why a couple of years ago, I went on and I started doing Zoom workshops before anybody was doing Zoom. And that has now turned into our YouTube channel with 20 workshops there. And then we came back. I thought, there's not enough people paying attention to the, to the YouTube channel. So uh, the True 316 Project. So then I started the podcast. 
And I'm excited about the podcast because every time somebody listens to the podcast, they listen to more than one. The yes. average the average is two and a half. So so today I looked at the, the, the download numbers, how many people were signing in. I don't know who they are, but there's, you know, so let's say it's a thousand people signed in today. But then I look at the how many pe- episodes were listened to today and it's 2,500. So a thousand people, but 20 means they're listening to more than one episode. And I'm delighted by that. That's, that's really great. So it's sticky in that sense. So what happens is you, you, if you look in Genesis chapter three and you want to understand what happened in the garden of Eden and you look in your Bible that you have or online Bible or on your phone or in print, they don't, they do not show you what the clear Hebrew words are. In a sense, they've piled up garbage on top of it. They've polluted it. And the worst problem is that the very the very first four Hebrew words, God says to the women in Hebrew, these four words, multiplying, I will multiply your itzabon and your haron. Okay, I just said the two Hebrew words. But I'm going to multiply and I'm going to multiply. When you say that twice in Hebrew, what that means is I'm really going to multiply. I'm really going to do it. And the word to multiply uh, you know, he said back in Genesis chapter one, you know, be fruitful and multiply. So it's in the words of blessing. When God talked to Abraham and when God talked to, well, for both of his uh, wives, uh, they had children, God says, I, I'm multiplying, I will multiply your offspring like the stars in the sky and the sands on the seashore. So there's only three times in the Old Testament, multiplying, I will multiply. And all three times of those, including Genesis 3.16, it's, it's in the context of blessing. Now, nobody gets the sense of blessing when they read the first words in their Hebrew or in their English translation of Genesis 3.16. But he's, you're sort of set up, oh, good, multiplying, I will multiply. What's he going to do that's so good? And then he says, it's a bone. That's bad news. And then he says, heron. That's good news. So let's skip to it. Word number four, multiplying, I will multiply. Number four, heron. What's that? That's your conception. Now, let's tie it in. What did he just say to the serpent? Her seed will crush your head. That's that's the same concept, seed, conception. So when he says, I'm going to multiply your offspring, your seed, your, well, any, I'm thinking in French now, I got to stay in English. So I'm going to multiply your offspring, capital O. That means I'm promising that the Messiah will come through you and you will be the victor. Your child will be the champion who will crush the head of that liar and murderer. And so what? that's a great good news. Of course, multiplying, I will multiply. That's good. And your, your conception, that's also good. I got, when I went to seminary, I heard it first time that I remember, I heard the word protevangelium. The protevangelium is in Genesis 3.15. That's the first announcement of the good news. Yeah, but it bothered me that the first announcement of the good news was to the serpent in Genesis 3.15, God's talking to the serpent, says, you know, her offspring is going to crush your head. And people go, oh, yeah, that's good news. He's going to be crushed. But it's bothered me that the announcement would be given to the serpent. But as Joy worked this out, I realized, no, no, we have the introduction of this concept that the serpent will be crushed. But then in 3.16, in the first words, we have the promise to the woman that your offspring will crush his head. So the protevangelium overlaps from 15 into 16. And there we have the good news. So the gospel is given right there, Genesis 3, 16. Multiplying, I will multiply your conception of your promised champion of the offspring. And of course, that's Jesus Christ. So we have that blessing. Now, the bad news, people get that. They get all hung up on that. The bad news is this word, it's a bone. And if you know Hebrew, and you know that the Hebrews like to make puns. So the word tree in Genesis 3, 1 is etz in Hebrew. And this word in Genesis 3.16a is itzabon. So it sounds like etz. So you have a tree-related something going on. So God says to the woman, I will multiply these two things. I'll multiply this itzabon, and I will multiply your conception. Well, what's the itzabon? He doesn't tell her. And I said to Joy one time, I said, he does, he does say what it is in the next verse when he's talking to the man. But how come he's doing it up here and not telling her what's going on? And she said, oh, that's a proleptic prophecy. <laughs> and I suppose I learned what a proleptic prophecy was in my previous studies, but I didn't remember. And so I said, what's a proleptic prophecy? And she's very polite. And she said, a proleptic prophecy is when uh, the cause is given, but the results is not yet explained. Okay. So the cause of something is she's going to experience it's a bone. 
But the results, what that itzabon is, we don't know. So you go down to Genesis 3.17 when God now turns to the man and he says, okay, stinker, you have been an active rebel. You weren't deceived like her. You disobeyed my voice on purpose and you followed his voice, the serpent's voice. And because of you, cursed is the earth and you will experience it's a bone. Now it's translated as toil or sorrowful toil. Joy hyphenates it in 316 and 317. So God says to her, I will multiply your sorrowful toil and your conception. And then God says to him, because of you, cursed is the earth and you will have sorrowful toil. All right. What does that really mean? It's used one more time. Let's find out. In Genesis 5, 29, Noah's dad says, oh boy, we're going to have a kid. And maybe this one, we've all been suffering from it's a bone, which is the sorrowful toil from working the ground that the Lord has cursed. So what is it's a bone? It's a, and by the way, Noah wasn't the, the promised capital O offspring. It wasn't until Jesus. Okay, but what is it's a bone then? It's sorrowful toil in field work. And that's not gender specific, that's gender inclusive. So God says it to her, you're gonna have it's a bone and I'll, you'll hear why in a moment. And then he says to the man, because of you, there's gonna be it's a bone. And then later on, uh, Noah's dad says, yeah, and hopefully this kid will help deliver us from this terrible it's a bone as we're trying to work the cursed soil that was cursed because of the man. So. There's two great things there. God says, I'm certainly going to give you it's a bone, actually because of him, but you'll experience it. And I'm going to give you conception. Two things. But if you read your English Bible, they only list one thing. They take those two ideas. By the way, neither of them has anything to do with childbirth. You know, like at the end of nine months, the actual process of giving birth to a baby, sorrowful toil and field work. No, that's not childbirth. Conception. No, I, you don't, I don't feel it. And it's nine months too soon. There's nothing about childbirth in those first four words. And yet all your Bible translations say, you will have pain in childbearing. Yes. Is this content resonating with you? I've written a book for women of faith in destructive relationships called, Is It Me? Making Sense of Your Confusing Marriage, A Christian Woman's Guide to Hidden Emotional and Spiritual Abuse. You can read reviews and find out more about my book on Amazon.com. It comes in paperback, Kindle, and Audible formats. I've also created a companion workbook for Is It Me, also available on Amazon. This workbook is like 11 power-packed therapy sessions to help you process through the important material you'll be learning from my book. These books are recommended by counselors and therapists all over the United States. I've also got a website specifically focused on helping women of faith find hope and healing. It's called flyingfreenow.com. I'll even give you the first chapter of my book and the first chapter of the companion workbook for free when you hop on my mailing list at the top of my website. Those two resources are going to help you figure out if your relationship is normal or destructive. And now let's get back to our episode. And that's a terrible thing because when we got to Africa, everybody said, see, God cursed the woman and, you know, with pain and childbirth. And there was a, we got a story in a village not too far away of a young woman who was just having her first baby. And I haven't done this, so I don't know, but I heard that if you have multiple children, often the first one maybe take longer and the other ones sometimes are quicker. So here she was surrounded by a batch of uh, uh, well-meaning ladies in, in those, in that village. They're the ones who were the, the uh, sage femme, that's the French word, what, uh, midwife. Okay. So the midwives for this woman in this, in this, I'll be polite, but it's a hut. Okay, so in this hut, here are these midwives, and they're saying to her, it's been 16 hours, and you haven't given birth to your child yet. You are a terrible young woman. You're keeping your husband from getting this baby. They took red hot, wow. tiny little chili peppers and smeared the juice in her eyes to punish her and to try and get her attention and to get her to work harder. They beat her on her belly, and they did other things, which actually made things swell up and made it harder. Oh, but they no. did that to her because you were supposed to have pain in childbirth. These were Catholic women or Protestant women. They all knew what their Bible said. And that was, you're supposed to have pain in childbirth. And it's not what it says. And so one of the, the heartbreaking concerns that we've always had since then is, look, God didn't curse Eve 
or Adam. He just cursed. The word curse, arar, is used two times. The serpent is cursed and the soil is cursed. Two curses. How do I know there's not more curses? Because it's only used twice. All right. So now we only use it twice. We've got two curses. The man isn't cursed. The woman isn't cursed. And yet it looks like it's equivalent to a curse and people treat it like a curse. There's a wonderful book that says something about beyond the curse. And I kind of playfully said to Joy one day, I think that book went beyond the curse, way beyond the curse, because they got there's they think there's a curse here and there's a curse there and there's a curse somewhere else around. The Jews in the Babylonian Talmud before the time of Christ, they actually talked about 10 curses on Eve. There's no curse on Eve. In, in mm -hmm. France, our professor took us to the great cathedral. For centuries, it was the tallest building in Europe beautiful spire going up in the sandstone pink cathedral and in the bas relief statues in the front of the portal uh, there's there's the the uh, the virgins you know with the oil and the virgins that don't have the oil they're kind of standing out from the stone but on the end there's eve and she's holding out a piece of fruit and she looks beautiful and she's just great hey I, I got this piece of fruit for you and then the professor with his french german accent he says come around here and look on her back. Look and see what's there. And, you know, we did. And here she had stone serpents embedded in her shoulders, writhing down her back and boils. And he says, see, the sculptor shows us his theology. He thought she was in league with the devil and she was filled with the, the poison of the serpent. And that's how she offered the apple to the man, the poor mm. sucker. She had all this satanic power in her according to the stone yeah statues there and that's all wrong that's all wrong look if you go back to genesis chapter three the first couple of verses i think it's the first five verses every time satan says you it's plural in hebrew in other words you too you too no you too you know you should eat you too should eat y'all both of you yeah. And he's not, so people say, oh, they draw these beautiful pictures. There's this serpent hanging from a tree and here's the fruit and here's this young woman by herself at the tree. That's not what happened. They were, are you kidding? This is, this is, the, they're on their honeymoon at, you know, the Garden of Eden bed and breakfast. They're not going to be separated. They, they go over to this important tree. They're not going to be separated. They're both there. And he speaks to both of them. Now, why does he say uh, the serpent spoke to Eve? Because the serpent spoke first to Eve, that's all. But he had, he said, you too, every time he talked. So they're both there and they both listen, but they don't hear the same way. The woman actually corrects him. They're supposed to rule over the animals. And so she does. She rules over him and says, no, that's not right. That's incorrect. But then he is the, the biggest liar in the world. Jesus later on called him the father of lies and a murderer. So he came to murder them. And how did he come to murder them? Well, he started lying by taking the form of a serpent. He didn't come there with his big, beautiful, angelic body and say, hello there, I'm the best angel in the universe. Mm -hmm. And I have uh, some contradictory advice for you. He didn't do that. He said, eh, you know, I'm a serpent and I'm, you know, you can rule over me. And, but I do have a few words for you. And he's lying just by getting in the serpent. And secondly, he's lying in the way he talks. And Joy, in her dissertation, she talks about how, in more detail what he does. By the way, on, on true316.com, Joy's dissertation is there. And people can you know buy it okay. in the shop. They can download the, all 400 pages and read the Hebrew and, and all of that. But is there a way for them to what get happened the- then is, Oh, I was just gonna say, is there a way for them to get the shortened 50 page thing? That's no, is that no longer published? Or? For you, for you, I've got such a deal. <laughs> <laughs> I got such a great. Right. So if you, if, if you go to true316.com and, and there'll be a little green toolbar right across the top and it says podcast friends, click on this green bar. Because okay. I, I try to be clear. Okay, so click on that green bar. It'll take you to a page and you can download the audiobook of of her uh, 50 page thing right there. It's about nice. two hours or so as an audiobook. And it's free. So just go right there and go ahead and get it. You can also go on Amazon. Uh, her book is called Man and Woman in Biblical Unity, and it's available from Amazon too. Okay. Uh, but, Thank you. But yeah, that's that. But it, I want to make it a freebie and I want people to get it. And so that's how you can get that. Okay, now I lost my place. All right, so uh, the two of them got tempted and the two of them responded. She was deceived, he wasn't. Two times in the New Testament it says he wasn't deceived. So what does that mean? He did it on purpose. 
Now, there were six cities of refuge that God instituted in Israel when the Jews moved into Israel, the promised land. Three on one side of the river and three on the other side of the river. What was a city of refuge for? Well, if you killed somebody, if you killed them on purpose, so you were a first degree murderer, then you were supposed to have a, a, a retribution and you were supposed to be put to death right away. But if you killed somebody and it was by accident, you didn't do it on purpose, you were a second degree murderer and you could flee to one of these six cities of refuge and the pursuers couldn't go there and they couldn't couldn't put you to death because there's a different level of guilt. Yeah, you killed somebody 100%, but you didn't do it on purpose. What happened with Eve was she ate. She ate the whole fruit 100%, but she didn't do it on purpose. She was deceived. Now, the man, though, he did it on purpose. So the man is what I call a first degree eater. And the woman is a second degree eater. And the judgment level is different. It's very different. By the way, people talk about Genesis chapter two, creation. Genesis chapter three, fall. It's sort of like they think that God built the man and the woman. Each of them had the right foot a little shorter, the right, right leg a little shorter than the left leg. And eventually these tipping persons were going to fall. You know, and God didn't do a very good job if he created us so we could fall. But I don't like that word fall. I, say, I call Genesis chapter two, uh, creation, and Genesis chapter three, attack. Okay, attack, not a fall, it's the attack. So what happened? We have this attacker, and what was the results? Well, he nicked her, and he winged her. He got her to eat and killed her, but boy, he got that man dead on. He got right into the guy's heart, because what happens? When they both eat, when they both realize that they're naked, when they both run and hide, when they both put on some fig leaf, uh, fig leaf uh, you know, haute couture, when, when they're both out there hiding and God says, where are you? The word's kind of general in my mind. It could have been, hey, hey, you guys, where are you? The man comes and he says, I heard you. I did this. I did that. And I, where did this I stuff come from? They were there on their honeymoon. Everything was together. But all of a sudden now he's saying, I, I, I did this. And then God says, who told you? You know, who told you this? And the man could have said, well, nobody told me that, but there was this voice over here came out of that serpent and he told us that you were wrong, God. But the man didn't point out the serpent, didn't even talk about the serpent. Instead, he says to God, now this is after the attack and whose side is he on? He says to God, the woman whom you gave to be with me. Now, he doesn't ever say the woman you gave me. Look out, that's wrong. Even Adam didn't mess that up. He said, the woman you gave to be with me all right, she gave me an, and an, an, yeah, yeah, I ate. So there's two blamings going on right here and a huge amount of, of uh, betrayal. He betrays the woman, but in the blaming, he says, the woman she gave me, whom you, God, gave to me. He's blaming God. He's blaming her. He's blaming God. Well, he's not confessing. He's not accepting. He, you know about sinful patterns in, in relationships, right? You talk about that all the time on your podcast. And so we have a terrible prototype of sinful relationship going on here. There's terrible betrayal by the husband and terrible accusation and blaming going on right there. And so when God speaks to the woman, he says, all right, now I just confirmed you as the enemy of Satan in Genesis 3.15. And in 3.16, I just confirmed for you that you're going to have offspring and you your offspring will crush his head. I, now I want to tell you a couple of things. And Joy calls this, I said, uh, she says that uh, God was... Uh, how she said he was, he was he was taking action in the first words of Genesis 3:16 but in the rest of Genesis 3:16 he's not doing anything new he's just telling her now that this attack has gone on and you each have responded in this way let me tell you what's going to happen you now have a mortal body and with etsev you will bring forth children now that's a mistranslated word again people say with terrible pain you will have children the word etsev is used other times in the Old Testament, never for childbirth. When we were in Africa, I came up with this illustration. When it rains in the tropics, and we were right on the equator, it rains all the time. And you're going along in a banana truck and you get caught in the mud. What happens? Everybody has to get out and push. And it's hard, hard effort to push out that truck. That's etsev. It's hard effort new muscles, you know, pelvic floor, all this stuff. It's hard now to, to deliver a baby. And when she was going to be outside of the Garden of Eden, which God knew she was soon going to be there. She didn't know that yet. But when she was going to be outside with effort, she was going to bring forth children. So he wants her to understand when you're having new effort, 
it's not that you're dying. Now, now is not the time. No, it's just this is your first baby and you'll have it with your second and third. But then he says, so that was the bad news. But then he says, you will bring forth children. When he said conception, that could have been just one child. When he said seed, you know, will crush Satan's head, that could have been just one child. But then he confirms, plural, you will have children. And just as I told you at the beginning in day six, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. I'm confirming, I'm telling you, this is what's going to happen. With effort, you're going to have children. Ah, that's good. Now in the next line, he says to her, your desire for your husband. There's no verb. So in Hebrew, you just put in is. Okay. So your desire is for your husband. And what kind of desire is that? Well, Joy calls it affection. That same word is used for another human back in Song of Solomon, where Solomon's lover says, you know, his desire is for me. It's good. It's great. I call it love. Joy says, you can't quite go that far. Say affection, but I still say love. So your love, her love is for her husband. So God looks in her heart and he says, now, you disobeyed, but you were deceived. I'm looking in your heart. And your love is for your husband. And now I'm going to tell you about him. But he will rule over you. And this ruling over is, is not a good thing. It's a bad thing. This is a warning to her. People think that these words that God just told her are words that he said to the man. Okay, man, go out there and rule over your wife. That's not what he said. She is married to the most sinful man in the world. Literally. Literally. And this man is going to try and rule over her. And how do we know that? When God talks to the man in verses 17, 18, and 19, and then he's done, we have one verse in verse 20 where they have a chance to do whatever they want. And the man rules over her by giving her a name. In Genesis chapter 2, when the man ruled over the animals and he named their names, there was what Hebrew scholars call this a naming formula. In England, they would have said, I W Sir Lancelot, okay, a naming formula. That's what it sounds like in Hebrew. So I W Sir Giraffe, I W Sir Ocelot, I W Lady Flipper, whatever, you know. So I, I W Queen Peacock. Okay. But but then in 320, I W. That's what the man says. So he's ruling mm -hmm. over her as if she's one of those animals down. Yes. So he's flipped things around. No longer does he allow God to rule over him because he decided to rule over himself and listen to Satan. And now he's going to try and rule over her. And he does with naming her. Now in Genesis chapter four, she still got her heart right because in the Hebrew it says, I have begotten a man, the Lord. And Dr. Walter Kaiser, who first taught me this in, in my course uh, in school, he, he said, you know, this could be taken two ways. I've gotten a man with the help of the Lord, or I've gotten a man who is the Lord. Well, is her first child going to be the offspring that's going to crush Satan's head? Maybe. And so she says, I've gotten a man, the Lord. I, here he is. Now, history turned out that Cain was not, not, not the good guy. And, and that's a shame. So think of all the heartbreak that she has. He, the man betrays her before God right there in the Garden of Eden. God confirms to her the good news. Then the man turns and, and name, treats her like an animal. Then her first child turns out to be like her husband. The second child turns out to be like her, worshiping God. It, it's a marriage situation from the very, very beginning. Mm. Jesus comes now and he, he is the offspring. He restores us. And when we go into the New Testament passages, if you don't understand Genesis 3.16, if you think woman was cursed, it skews all of these New Testament passages. And that's what's in seasons two, three, and four of the Eden podcast. Wow. That lays a great foundation and is a great setup for people to go over there and listen to the rest. And here's why it's so important, you guys, because we are coming out of this, our brains have been programmed after years and years of being, of marinating in a certain theology that says that women are less than men and that God holds men up in higher esteem than women and that women are good for, you know, being helpers, but that's it. And we're coming out of, and, and we bought into that and it contributed to our, many of the people listening to this podcast are coming, are involved in marriages that 
are very problematic and very unequal. And they're being spiritually manipulated and abused, not only by their partner, but also in their religious communities. Mm -hmm. So it's important to understand the, the truth because that's not what your identity is. When God looks at you, he doesn't see you the way that your husband maybe sees you or that your church pastor or leaders maybe see you. He sees you the way God saw Eve. That's he right. sees you as precious yes. and important in his whole grand scheme of things. And he sees you. He sees the good that you do. One of the things that just blew me away um, in my own experience, and I've seen this over and over again with other women, is that we do love our husbands. We love them and would have done anything we could to help them, to make the situation better, to make that marriage amazing. That was our desire. And we just kept hitting our head against a wall because we weren't, it wasn't getting reciprocated. And, and yet what ends up happening is so many of these women end up actually being the scapegoat. They're, ironically, they're the ones that are accused of, which is kind of how the verses have been changed to kind of make it seem like Eve was the bad one. These women are being accused of being the one that's actually causing the problem instead of the one that's actually trying to redeem the situation and make it better. I, I met a friend online. She's, she's, a, she's a wonderful person. Uh, she was a Bible study fellowship leader for 17 years and then a regional leader. And, and, uh, and she said, you know, I really like these uh, things, these workshops you did. Is that on online? And I said, well, no. And she said, can I, you should put, you should put that on YouTube. And I said, I don't know how to do YouTube. And she said, do you mind if I put it on YouTube? And I said, that's great. Go ahead and put it on YouTube. I didn't know that she didn't know how to put it on YouTube either. She went on to YouTube and figured out how to do it. And then she put up a channel for me. Her wow. Name jo- her name is Joanne. So then, then she says, and I'm holding it up for you. So here, here's the copy of the book of Eden, Genesis 2 and 3. Uh, she said, I think that each one of your episodes should have a study guide. So we put that up as our blog posts for the first eight episodes. And after all that, while I was working through this with, I decided this is Joy's material in Genesis. So I would I typed up and printed out every episode script before I ever recorded it, and I had it. I had Joy look at it, which took time on her part, and she looked at it and she'd say, mm, "You know, that's not quite right," or "You forgot this," or "Oh, I like that." So when I got done, I had eight approved transcripts, plus I had eight study guides written by Joanne, and so we put the oh, and jo- Joanne figured out and she made it a book, and now it's on on Amazon as the Book of Eden. Yeah. Uh, so that really helped out a lot. Right now, we're in the middle of putting on, you can see the, the cover of this. This one is called Beyond Eden. And this is Ephesians 5 and 6. And it, and it should be out pretty soon here. And then we'll have book three on episode, on season three, and book four on season four. But the big thing I want to talk about in, in episode, in season two is that it's supposed to be so good to be married that Paul in Ephesians 5 uses a marriage between a husband and wife to give an example of how Christians are supposed to get along in church. So in Ephesians 5, 18, he says, be being filled with the Holy Spirit. And a lot of people just take that verse as a landing point. They kind of touch down on that verse and then they take off and they add in all kinds of details that they come up with in their own minds. Uh, be filled with the spirit. Oh yeah, that must mean this. It means that it means the other thing. Well, maybe they get ideas from other verses, but it's not in that one verse. Paul is working his way through the structure of Ephesians 5, and he's going to tell us right after 518 what he means. What do you do when you're being filled by the Holy Spirit? He gives you four things. In the first part of verse 19, the second part of verse 19, then in verse 20, then in verse 21. And what he says is that you should be teaching and correcting one another because you're filled with the spirit. And then in verse 21, submitting to that teaching and correction you get from one another. Now that doesn't talk about healing or, or speaking in tongues or you know, that's talking about when you're being filled with the Holy Spirit, this is what you're doing. You're teaching and correcting one another 
Old or young can do that. Male or female can do that to one another. And then you submit to that to one another. And he changes the word submit totally, N not from an over under vertical submission. He turns it into a horizontal reciprocating mutual type of submission. So he says, submitting yourselves one to another. He really changes the meaning. And then the very next verse, he gives an example of that kind of mutual submission, husbands and wives. Mm. Well, if that wasn't a good example, he wouldn't have used it. He's right. talking about Christian husbands and Christian wives in a Christian household. He calls them one flesh. And then he develops that idea of one flesh much, much more through the rest of chapter five. And he pulls it out of Genesis 2, 24, where the husband and wife become one flesh. And the word in Hebrew for one is echad. It means a unity of parts in one. So you've got two people become one flesh. That echad is from also from later on in Genesis where he says, Hero Israel, the Lord is one, echad. So there's some tremendous deep theology. And to, to dare to compare a Christian marriage as an illustration of this kind of beautiful unity that Christians have with each other and with, and with Christ would not, would not be right unless it was God's plan for us to have good marriages. Yes. So as the Holy Spirit's in the heart of the guy and in the heart of the gal, and as they're together and they're with Christ and they're submitting one to another and they're teaching and correcting one another, that's how we're supposed to live it out. Yeah. I think your example of how Joanne and your wife, how you related to them and you showed them honor and you guys, all three of you worked together Yeah. and look at what you guys have put together. I mean, the influence of the the resources that you have available to people now, we, you have no idea of the impact that's going to make on the world, not just in our generation, but in future generations. I'm praying for that. I really yeah. am. Yeah. And that's because that's a direct, I really believe that God honors men and women who honor each other, who honor one another, just like that. Yeah. If If we had churches and marriages that were living that out, we could change. I mean, this world would change. Mm -hmm. We don't, but we can do our part. And that's what you're doing. And it's very encouraging to see. We have listeners in 57 countries now. That is amazing. Yeah. Well, this message is super important. I hope that all of you who are listening will go check out his podcast, The Eden Podcast. Um, it's easy to listen to. It's easy to find. And then it sounds like I haven't been on your website, but it sounds like you have all these downloadable resources to help out too. And it'd be great if you guys are into this, put together a little study, get together with another woman or two or three women and go through this like a study together. Talk about it. Talk about the, the implications of the truth of what he's, because he'll take, he takes verses that you've, I've been reading them a certain way my whole life. And it really, it's poisoned in some ways, as I was getting out of my abusive relationship, I thought, you know, the Bible is not safe for me. And I loved the Bible before, but I thought the Bible is not safe for me, but it is. Yes, We're it just is. reading it the wrong way. We're, it's like Satan's version of the Bible is definitely not safe for us. But God's version is. We just have are, to figure out what are, that there is. Are, there are a lot of books, you know, that have come out in recent years, and I, I love the people that do it, have written them, and I know a lot of them. And uh, and they're, I, they're still turning around in circles because they don't have the Genesis three sixteen part fixed. They, yeah. they don't have that. They don't have that insight. And so, we're just trying to get out a, a preliminary presentation of what's in First Corinthians eleven, what's in First Corinthians fourteen, what's in First Timothy two and three, what's in First Peter three. And, and as that gets out there and they realize we have to take into account what happened in the Garden of Eden and get that right, then I think it's going to open up a lot of eyes. It's going to help us an awful lot. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much for coming on, spending some time talking with us. And for those of you who are listening, thank you for listening. And until next time, fly free. Fly free.